Today I'm going to be talking about BiPAP and CPAP. We're going to go over when to use each one of them, so stick around and find out more. Hey guys, this is Daniel from Doldier Media, and today I'm going to be talking about BiPAPs and CPAPs. Now, BiPAPs and CPAPs is something a lot of students have a hard time with when they first get introduced to them. It's something that you've never really experienced or seen prior to actually going into the healthcare field. Yet they are something that you are gonna see in the hospital periodically. Whether you work in the emergency department or you work in some other floors, you're gonna use a BiPAP or CPAP at least once during a shift. BiPAP and CPAP are something that we call non-invasive mechanical ventilation or non-invasive ventilation. And what that means is that we're actually not putting an endotracheal tube in someone and we're controlling their breathing strictly with a mask. There are certain disease processes that we see in the hospital that need to be treated differently. Whether it's gonna be CHF or COPD, you're gonna put them on two different modalities when you see these patients. Let's get started. Now a CPAP is something that has only one constant pressure in a hospital, you're going to use a CPAP most commonly for sleep apnea or some kind of CHF or oxygenation problem. Now, why do you use it for sleep apnea and why is this significant? Well, sleep apnea is pretty fascinating. When somebody has sleep apnea, what that means is that they actually stop breathing. Apnea means no breathing. When someone has sleep apnea and they go to sleep, what ends up happening is during REM sleep, our body gets paralyzed. And when someone gets paralyzed, the muscles that normally hold the trachea up start to collapse. And when the trachea starts to collapse, the person no longer has the ability to breathe, so they stop breathing for a period of time during the night. While this is happening, the heart rate actually starts pumping because there's not enough oxygen getting to the brain, so the heart starts pumping and the person's heart rate goes up to well above 100, and the oxygen goes down well below 90%. Now this is a lot of stress on the heart. So people that have sleep apnea tend to actually never really sleep at night. After years of having sleep apnea, Many people who struggle with this have heart problems and have other problems. They can't focus, they can't, they always feel tired and they just can't stay sharp. So sleep apnea is something that's actually pretty dangerous. Many celebrities recently have been diagnosed with sleep apnea and even died from sleep apnea recently. Many people in the community have sleep apnea. Uh, if you ever hear somebody snoring, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have sleep apnea, but that is a sign that they might be in that place where they could potentially get sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is not related to weight. Although it is more common in people who are overweight, it is not related to weight. There are plenty of skinny people out there who have sleep apnea. Trust me, I might be one of them. So how they find out if somebody has sleep apnea is usually during a sleep lab study, somebody goes to a room, sleeps with monitors on them, and there's cameras everywhere, and during the night, they'll actually get recorded stopping breathing. Now, if it happens less than five times in an hour, then they probably don't have it or it's mild. Some people stop breathing over 30 times in an hour during the night, and that's pretty severe, as you see in this chart posted right here. In a hospital, if you have sleep apnea, we're gonna put you on a CPAP. What a CPAP does is, it keeps that airway open. That pressure from the machine you're, that you're breathing against keeps your airway from collapsing on itself, and it keeps you from having any kind of apneic events or not breathing during the night. Another time that you're probably going to use a CPAP machine in the hospital is when somebody has a CHF exacerbation. Now, CHF is congestive heart failure. When somebody has this, they usually get exacerbations if they have a little bit too much salt or they have a little bit too much fluid in them. Your blood pressure gets so high that it eventually has to go somewhere else where there's less pressure. And the two places that blood or the volume of fluid in your body go to is down in your legs because of gravity and in your lungs because there's no pressure in your lungs. So when somebody starts getting fluid in their lungs because of CHF, we call that pulmonary edema. And some people feel like they're actually physically drowning, whether they're not even in the water, but they feel like they're drowning. So when they come into the hospital, we put them on a CPAP machine and that CPAP, the pressure from the CPAP will actually push that back into the bloodstream, all the fluid, and it'll help them with their breathing. Now, if you give them a diuretic, which makes them pee, that's going to get a lot of fluid off of them. And with the CPAP together, that's going to make them turn around, hopefully within an hour or two. Beyond those two times that you might use a CPAP, another time that it might help is if somebody's having a problem with oxygenation. The CPAP is what we call PEEP also. It increases the pressure in the lungs, which helps expand the alveoli just enough to that we could actually get better gas exchange. And when we get better gas exchange, 
we oxygenate better. Now a BiPAP is different. A BiPAP is actually two pressure gradients as opposed to one pressure gradient. So somebody with the BiPAP is gonna have two pressure gradients. The two pressure gradients create this thing called pressure support. It's primarily used for respiratory failure and it's something that's very popular on COPD exacerbations because it avoids intubation. It's the last step before somebody gets intubated and it's been shown to work and help improve and turn around patients pretty quickly. What's cool about a BiPAP is that it's actually the same exact machine as a CPAP, it's just a different mode. Now, a lot of people in the home health community, they call their machines a CPAP even though they're capable of doing BiPAP ventilation. Same thing in a hospital, you'll most likely hear somebody say BiPAP, but the machine is capable of doing CPAP modes. So the machine is the exact same thing, it's just a different mode of ventilation. How a BiPAP works is, you set two pressure gradients. The first one is inspiratory positive airway pressure, and the second one is expiratory positive airway pressure. Now what happens is, when a patient's taking a deep breath in, they're usually going to get the inspiratory one, which is a higher set pressure. And when they're breathing out, the pressure gets lower so they don't feel like they're breathing against a, a, a hard pressure and they can actually exhale. What this helps with is the difference between the two numbers creates pressure support and it creates flow which allows the patient to blow off a lot of CO2. Now if somebody has COPD, their CO2 is already going to be abnormally high. And if you put them on a CPAP, they're actually going to be breathing in their CO2 back. So it's actually gonna be more dangerous than it is gonna be helpful for them. A person that has COPD, which is very common to see in the hospital, they're gonna require a BiPAP or a bi-level ventilation. So let's say you put somebody on a BiPAP, you put them on 10 over five, very basic setting, and you do an ABG in about an hour. And you see that this patient is not turning around. So what you have to do is increase that pressure support. So instead of going up with both numbers, all you have to do is increase the inspiratory pressure. And if you increase that, it creates a greater difference between the two. And the difference between the two will allow them to blow off a lot of CO2. So in this kind of situation, you put them on 15 over 5. And with that pressure support now being 10, they have a lot more CO2 being blown off because there's a lot more flow and circulation of air in the lungs. In the hospital, we use a BiPAP because we do not want to intubate COPD patients. If somebody who has COPD gets intubated, it's going to be very difficult for them to get extubated just because of their disease process. So what we do is we try to get them before intubation on a BiPAP as long as we can. After a few hours, if we don't see them getting turned around, we do resort to intubation, which does help them. It's just a lot longer for them to get extubated. Beyond COPD, anybody in the hospital who's having any kind of respiratory failure or any, any kind of trouble breathing, the extra ability for them to have pressure in their lungs is going to help expand their alveoli, which is going to help them blow off a lot more CO2. So you're going to commonly, during a rapid response or during some kind of emergent situation, put somebody on a BiPAP. So get ready to put them on. Now, if you've never had a BiPAP on you, how it feels like is as if you're driving and you stick your head out the window and you're trying to breathe against that. It's not really comfortable, so a lot of patients won't like it, but it definitely does help them. If you're watching this, you're probably thinking to yourself, is there anything I could do before I put someone on a BiPAP? Or what if your patient doesn't like BiPAP? Well, there is something. <laughs> you're in luck. There's a thing called the high flow nasal cannula or high flow velocity cannula. Now, what this does is it reduces dead space by about 30% according to some studies, and it adds about a peep of three to five. So what you do is you put them on a on a very high flow, some of them go up to 60 liters, some of them go up to 40 liters, and that flow that you give them through their nasal cannula through this specific machine will actually help them breathe a little bit easier. Because their dead space is reduced by a significant amount, they have an easier time catching their breath. And that's the step that we do prior to putting somebody in a BiPAP. Lately, with what's been going on in the pandemic, we've actually been putting a lot of people on vapotherms or high flow nasal cannulas. If you've never seen a high flow nasal cannula, 40 liters or 60 liters doesn't mean that's how much oxygen we're giving them. On these machines, you can actually regulate the oxygen through the FiO2. So I can be giving somebody 21% oxygen, which is room air, yet still have them on 60 liters of flow. The flow is just there to help them breathe. It's kind of like a BiPAP, except this is going to be a little bit more comfortable for a lot of patients. They can actually eat with this on, and this might be the best route for the patient. There's so much more I could say about BiPAPs and CPAPs. I was recently asked by somebody to make a video about BiPAPs and CPAPs and explaining their differences. So I hope you guys like this. If you guys did like this, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.